Hi, guys. <laughs> evening. Um, well, oh, I think we've already said good evening, haven't we? Okay. So I'm not going to say it again. So this evening, we are looking at uh, the book of Acts. Uh, Sai started last week. Um, we looked at Acts 1, uh, Jesus' final words to the church, and, then, and the great promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so here we have uh, a book written by Luke, Luke who wrote uh, the gospel, um, and he gives us this sort of, uh, sort of part two, the story of the early church. And so this week, what we're doing is we're actually jumping a couple of chapters because it's our gift day. We want to look, about, we want to look at uh, empowered by the Spirit by generosity. So you can see here and you can see where we're going through the book of Acts. So all exciting stuff to look forward to. So um, gift day, gift day. You know, there was a, a little boy who went up to his vicar and, and he said, when I grow up, I'm going to do that again. <laughs> the voice didn't quite come out how it was in my head. <laughs> but we'll try. When I grow up, and it's still not working, but I will plow on. When I grow up, I'm going to be a doctor, Vicar, and make lots of money, and I'm going to give you lots of money. And the Vicar was like, oh, that's so kind, and that's so generous of you. Why? Why, why, would you, why would you do that? Because my mummy and daddy say that you're the poorest vicar we've ever had at this church. <laughs> ha ha. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, speaking about giving is never straightforward. Uh, it's, it, and it's hard when you're uh, in leadership. It's hard to get it right, actually. Um, for some, a poor leader, a poor vicar, if you talk about giving too much, yes? And for some, you're a poor vicar if you don't talk about it enough or don't talk about it at all. I mean, I, I happen to be uh, in the camp that I think it's really important to talk about giving. It really is important to talk about giving. You know, Jesus, um, someone did a, a, an assessment on the things that Jesus says. Around 20% of what Jesus said was sort of around this ballpark area of generosity and giving, and hence we do. When we want to be good leaders, and we want to talk about giving, not because it's like "give us your money." Sorry, that also didn't come out in the way <laughs> that it was in our head, in my head. But it, it is about <laughs> formation. It's about actually becoming more like Jesus. We're in the business of becoming more like Jesus, and Jesus knew that there's something about generosity and giving that opens our hearts up to him and to become more like him. That's why it's really important to talk about it. I sometimes just wish it wasn't me doing the talking about it. But here I sit um, before you. And in fact, as I was reading and looking at this topic, I, I noticed a resistance in me. I did. I noticed a resistance in me. I'm like, what's going on here? Why am I really like, I don't really want to talk about this. And it is because... In, in generosity, I, I, don't, I, I don't sort of see myself as a particularly generous person. And I, I know that's a strange thing to say, isn't it? And no one really likes to sort of see themselves as not generous. And I, I'm generous in certain things, but there are certain areas where I, I, I notice a resistance in terms of, of giving. And some of it's to do with past and, uh, and how I view myself and the world and God. And I even noticed we had a barbecue for our life group last night in our, um, in our garden. Anyone wants to join a life group, um, please come and see me. We've got a load of life groups, and they're really wonderful. And in the life group, we, had some, we were toasting marshmallows. And I bought these marshmallows, which are the size of a fist. I mean, seriously, they were like, like snowballs. And the kids, my boys, I've got three boys. And we had a lot of kids there, and they were all like, oh, eyes lit up. And uh, there weren't that many. And my, one of my kids came up to me and goes, Daddy, can I... Um, he doesn't talk like a posh kid. But, Daddy, can I... Can I Father, may I have... <laughs> he, he said, Daddy, can, can I have your marshmallow? And I noticed the... In me. 
and I'd sort of forgotten that I'm doing a talk about generosity the next evening. And I sort of, and I felt that, mm, oh, okay. But it's that kind of, and I always, when I have that impulse, that I think of, uh, do you know the Finding Nemo, that, you know, with the, the seagulls? Uh, and they go, mine, 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 mine. And I always sort of think of that little chorus in my head when I resist the, the urge for generosity. And, and to me, it's to do with some past. It's to do with having what I sort of understand is a scarcity mindset, a, a belief, an actual core belief. There's not enough to go round. There's not enough to go round, Tom. There's not enough energy. There's not enough time. There's not enough love to go round. There's certainly not enough money to go round. Versus an abundance mindset, which is we have a father in heaven who is an abundant, abundant father who longs to give good gifts to his children. I have a friend of mine, Renee, who travels around the world and she, she's in, in, based in South Africa. She works with Tear Fund now as a sort of uh, uh, an ambassador for Tear Fund. She flies around years ago when I knew she was doing a lot of traveling. I said, how do you afford all this traveling? And she goes, well, my, my father is a billionaire. And I, and I just went, oh. <laughs> oh, wow. And I went, Toto, oh, so lucky. I wish my father was a billionaire. <laughs> and, and then I look at her, and she's sort of flickering with laughter. And I'm like, what? And she goes, and I go, oh, you're talking about God. And she, yeah. <laughs> And, 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 and she goes, of course I'm talking about God. My father's skint. <laughs> uh, but she's someone I love being around because she has, she has an abundance mindset. And I don't mean this in a sort of, she sort of, you know, doesn't care. Just in a sense of a trust that God will look after. If God wants her in a place, then he will provide the flight, the ticket to get her there to speak. Um, of scarcity versus abundance. I wonder, you know, we all have some kind of response along that sort of scale, don't we? I wonder where you might be. But God is in the, he's in the heart business, isn't he? He's in the business of, of changing our hearts, of calling our hearts to him, always, always calling our hearts to him, but also transforming our hearts. And it seems, it seems in this area, God seems to do his good work in us as he draws us to become more like Jesus for the benefit of others, and especially around this issue of giving. Now, I want you to have in your mind the widow's might as, as I talk this evening. I want you to have that, the mind. You remember when the, 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 the woman comes and all, everyone is watching people give masses of cash and then the widow brings very little, and, and, uh, but it is all that she can give and she gives it and Jesus, um, and Jesus blesses her and says, here, this is about, it's about heart attitude, not about the size of the gift. It is about our response, our response, a response to God who asks, what are you willing to give? So let's just take a moment. I've barely started. Uh, Father, we just give you our hearts once more this evening. Lord, we don't want more information. Lord, would you reveal, you, would you reveal yourself to us this evening that we might be generous like Jesus? Amen. So, Acts 4. Acts 4 is just after where the Spirit of God has been poured out. The God, Jesus goes uh, and he says, I will, be, you know, I'm, you, I will not leave you on your own. The Spirit is going to come. And so Jesus comes and dwells in each and every one of them um, by, by the Spirit. And in this particular chapter, Acts 4, Peter and John, they've healed a blind man at the gate. They are arrested. They've been brought before the Sanhedrin. Then they are released. And then Luke writes this. Uh, he, he writes something very similar to what we're going to be reading here in Acts 2, uh, as if he's reiterating something that he wants us to really understand as readers. He, he wants us to understand that, to, that the church was transformed. It was growing. It was growing at a massive rate. And we're going to just pick through some of these lines here. So it says this, it says, all the believers were in one heart and mind. Now that all, what do we mean by all? In, in Acts 1, Luke has already told us that there are 5,000 men in the church. Now, scholars suggest that because it's just, you just counted the men in those days. So here, we, 
we can imagine that it must be 15 to 20,000 people in this church. This is a mega church existing as little life groups, as little home groups around Jerusalem. Okay, and there are lots of people in need. Lots of people in need. Why were they in need? There were thousands of visitors. They were visiting because of Pentecost, the festival. Um, and then the Spirit came. Um, and they are displaced from their homes. They've given up, some of them given up their countries, their traditions, their families. And made costly decisions to follow Jesus. And therefore there are some significant practical needs. And here we have Luke writing this. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. A little bit more of that later. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them brought the money from, from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Extraordinary. Now, crucial little point here. When they have sold their fields and they come and they place it at the apostles' feet, it is not strictly for the apostles, not for their particular feet, okay? It's, I was going to say, not for them to, you know, buy nice sandals or whatever. It is for them to distribute that which they have been brought. So it is for the church and for the needy, especially amongst the church, not just for the apostles. Okay, that's a little key little moment there. And the church is filled with the Holy Spirit, which is the life of God. Gordon Fee described that as God's empowering presence. God's presence fills the church in an extraordinary way. And what happens? What happens when the church is imbued with God's empowering presence? Yes, they speak in tongues. Yes, there is some supernatural healings and some incredible sermons, and the church grows exponentially. But crucially, Luke wants us to understand that there is a particularly practical outworking to the Holy Spirit coming on the church. It is, it is practical. For those of you who are practically minded, this is a glorious truth here. Because what happens? Uh, people look after and give to each other. It's absolutely wonderful. You see, if we're filled with the life of God, with the agape of God, then we are filled with God's priorities. His priorities become our priorities. And what are his priorities? Look after each other. Look after each other. It's practical, you see? It is supernaturally empowered, but it's practical. Look after each other. Lord, would our, would our priorities be your priorities? Would this church's priorities be your priorities? That we might look after each other. You see, someone once sent, said the health of any church, the health of any community, can be measured in the ways in which we care and look after each other. First and foremost. And then we go from there. It's a daunting passage. A little daunting, isn't it? It's sobering to see that kind of outrageous, radical generosity. How, how do we do that? How do we, how do we live like that? And it is also a little bit conceptual. I find it difficult to imagine. Uh, and as I was reading it, I go, oh, Luke, it's difficult to imagine. And then he, he literally goes and says, ah, you're finding it difficult to imagine. Here is an example of somebody who did this. And so he gives us this lovely, beautiful example. And this is in uh, the, our next slide uh, about Joseph. So Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is our first introduction to Barnabas. I don't know whether you're familiar with the book of Acts, but Barnabas plays a really significant role. And I love the fact that his nickname, yeah, his nickname is Son of Encouragement. 
That is his nickname because, the, because how he has lived is marked. If you look at the book of Acts, and I'd love to do a study on this, but there's no time. But even his name, that name encouragement is parakletos. And those of you know that actually the Holy Spirit is the paraclete, the one who walks alongside. Isn't that cool? Wouldn't it be wonderful to be, uh, you know, the nicknames in the church? Yeah, what, what might they be? What, it, what, what, what might be your name? Uh, son of encourage, son of passion, compassion, son of patience, daughter of courage, daughter of wisdom. I love that. But we can't do a study on, on Barnabas, but we do need to know how significant he is. He's involved with Paul's conversion. He speaks on behalf of Paul to the apostles who, don't, who aren't quite sure of Paul, who has been persecuting Christians for many, many, many a month and suddenly is now wants to become an apostle. And it's Barnabas who speaks on his behalf. So without Barnabas, we may not have had, to see if, we may not have had Paul, in fact. And later on, he helps Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, and Paul reconcile their relationship. And without Barnabas, we may not even have had the Gospel of Mark. Wow. But his ministry starts, and this is the key thing, his ministry starts with generosity. I find this fascinating. The first thing that we discover about him is that he, he, he does this outrageous act of generosity, so empowered by the, the Holy Spirit that he, that he gives this field. I, I find it interesting, you'd normally plant seeds into a field, but he actually planted his field into the ministry of the church. Just thought it was interesting. Anyway, um, but, and this is not just extra cash at the end of his month's earnings. Okay, this isn't the spare bit of expenses. This is, this is radical selling the family inheritance, land, real estate, and sowing it into the ministry. Wholehearted and radical giving. But what did Barnabas know? What did he know? that empowered him to do this. He must have, what compelled him to do this? And I, this is a little bit of conjecture on my part here. I've been slightly sort of, I, I, I'm imagining he knew this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick some points out from the passage here um, and imagining that this is what Barnabas knew about generosity and about giving. Because for him to do this outlandish gift, um, he must have known something um, of these truths of generosity. So I've got four short points, okay? <laughs> short. Um, I've got four short points, okay? And they spell acts. And I know for some of you, you quite like this sort of stuff, and you're going to be really excited when I reveal T and then S. And maybe while I'm talking about the first one, you're thinking about the next one. I know there are some of you out there who enjoy that. So uh, there are some of you here that I couldn't give a monkeys. Okay. So the first one is all is gift. This is a really profound and important uh, thing that we understand, that everything is gift. And Barnabas knew this. It says, um, it says in verse 34, it says, God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among you. And I think the key aspect of that sentence is the God's grace. They receive the gift of grace, which is the Holy Spirit, the great blessing, and they respond accordingly. And right there and then, we have something of Christianity. We have something of the gospel here, yeah? Grace always comes first, okay? The gift comes first. God, in the scriptures, always makes the first move. That's what we need to understand. He brings the gift. Even from right at the beginning in Genesis 1, we see God gives, God gives, God gives, God gives. He gives, he gives names to the animals. He gives, he gives um, Adam and he gives Eve. And he all the way gives and gives and giving all the way to finally he gives his only son. All his gift, mercy, love, forgiveness. We receive this as gift as Christians. That's all we do. We, we receive that as gift. And so therefore our right standing and our relationship with God is gift, our inheritance of eternal life, <laughs> gift that we don't deserve. Um, it cost us nothing, cost him everything. And I can go further with this. This is an abundance mindset. Can you see how the gospel encourages us to have an abundance mindset? The food we eat, gift. The friends we have, gift. The marshmallows that we might toast upon the fire, gift. 
the air we breathe, gift, and say it quietly. Even the money we've earned, all is gift from him. C.S. Lewis once described Christianity as, next slide, as Christianity is a kind of giving. Yeah, it's a kind of giving. God, God has poured out his generosity to us in Jesus, and we are called to respond in faith and generosity to others. It's a kind of giving. And Jesus says, and Luke says something similar in the book of, um, sorry, Matthew says that Jesus records Matthew, sorry, Matthew records Jesus saying, freely you have received, freely give. We have received so much, therefore freely give. And I think actually uh, C.S. Lewis should have said this, Christianity is a kind of re-giving. Is that allowed to re-quote uh, C.S. Lewis and, and, and add a couple of letters? So Christianity is a kind of re-giving in that sense. We've received, we have received so much that we give back to him. And in doing that, we enter in, in some, uh, some people describe as a, a kind of a cycle of blessing. We step into a stream of blessing, of, of, of receiving the gift and we give it away. We receive so much and we give it away. We receive so much and we give it away. And in doing that, we, re, we become part of, a, sort of caught in a beautiful cycle of, of grace giving and blessing. Amazing. Many of it, and it's a spiritual principle, this. And many of us have experienced this, not just with money. It's not just about money. It's a, it's a spiritual principle that applies in all areas of our lives, doesn't it? Um, the more you put in, the more you get out. Yeah? The more you put in, the more you get out. In church life, in work life, in friendship, in relationships, in intimacy, it's a spiritual principle. And it is the same when it comes to our giving. So that's the first thing, all is gift. The second thing is this, we have a choice. We have a choice, we get to choose, okay. And I think this is important in the context of this passage. I was once in a school Bible study, I was a teacher before I was a vicar, and in a school Bible study I was with some teenagers and a particularly smart Alec kind of kid, he wasn't called Alec, um, just, he, 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 we were reading this and we we're talking about, you know, giving property out and a shared common fund. And, uh, and he said, sir, isn't this proof that God wants us all to be communists? Which is actually a really reasonable thing to ask if you see this passage in its context, if you, if you read it. And he's like, well, that's sort of communism, isn't it? Aren't we supposed to all be communists? Now, I didn't go in... <laughs> I'm not going to go into any sort of political, socio-political sort of stuff here. But, I mean, I said, I, I don't think this is a redistribution sort of program. It's not mandated from the center. And the crucial line here is in verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. And I think the crucial point here, unlike the communists' uh, kind of rule of previous century, which was mandated from the center, where you shall, you shall do this. Everyone next week, bring all that you own, we'll pile it up in the middle of, of the auditorium and we'll just share it out, okay? I, I don't think that this is, I'm not sure that would, I'm not sure we want to put that on Andy Mead, <laughs> okay? Um, who's our operations director, for those of you who don't know. Um, but the key difference is all the believers, there is choice here. We get to choose as individuals, what we give. You see, this giving, as far as I can tell, is an expression of generosity that emerges from the will of these individuals whose hearts are broken by the Holy Spirit and want to pour out in generosity to those in need. So in some ways, this isn't a necessarily a blueprint for how we need to operate church. Not necessarily, it might be. But I, I think it's particularly uh, revealing of what happens when the Holy Spirit comes on individuals and, and a corporate and, and a body and, and they respond accordingly in extraordinary and radical acts of generosity. It's beautiful. So we all get to choose. We all get to choose. Do you remember 2 Corinthians 9? Paul riffs on this when he says, each person should give what they have decided in their own hearts to give. Okay, and I'm going to be encouraging a little bit later what, uh, you to, in your own heart, what is it, Lord? 
not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful. Everyone goes, cheerful giver. <laughs> cheerful. God loves a cheerful giver. Sorry, that was really mean. <laughs> that was quite mean, wasn't it? Sorry, forgive me. You have to forgive me. <laughs> so, I think I want to say here, I'm not here to say that you have to give to St. Michael's. We get to choose. I'm not here to say you have to give to our, to our buildings and resources. We get to choose. You know, some of you here from other churches, I would say, I do think we need to give. In some senses, it doesn't matter where we give. But the issue is our hearts, where are we giving? It's actually how we're giving before God. So I think it's a, a really a fundamental part of our formation. So all is a gift. We get to choose. You get to choose. I get to choose. And the third one, giving is a key to transformation. Now, Barnabas didn't know what his field was going to lead to. He had no idea. It was a significant gift, and I think a significant marker uh, uh, in, in, in the generosity of, 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 of the church. But I, I also think it probably had an incredible propulsion to his ministry. It was the starting point. He didn't know that he would be talked about 2,000 years later in a Stoke Gifford, whatever. You know, it was the giving of a field. It was the giving of a field. None of us know the implications of our gifts. And that's why we, we, we do them quietly and secretly, and we're not telling everyone, <laughs> is that what you've given me? Because I've given this. Yeah? We sow, and he grows. I like that. None of us know, but we sow it out, and he grows. And we are sitting in the fruit of, of incredible generosity, if you want to hear the story of this building and, this, and the journey that we are still on and have been on and are on in the life of St. Michael's, I really encourage you to listen to Julie's incredible talk this morning. She's speaking on a different passage, but speaking on the story of St. Michael's. And it is enlightening. I've been here four years. She's been here 40, 40 years. And, 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 the, and the story of faith, incremental faith, I'm going to come on to that in a moment, but uh, I just want to say that. Um, and there are some amazing little moments, you know, of, of, of giving, beautiful stories of giving. So um, the fourth and final point here I want to make is there are steps to generosity. And I made this point in the autumn, um, and I used the image of uh, stepping stones. And I wanted to, because it's the evening service, and maybe some of you were here, but you wouldn't have remembered it was weeks ago, months ago. Um, uh, and uh, apparently, apparently uh, people listening to a speaker only, only remember 7% of what they say. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's just the marshmallow. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I really want us to try and remember this, okay? So this is, if this is the 7%, remember this. Because I, I used to have, well, I used to have boys. I used to have little boys, and then they're quite big. And we used to jump across stepping stones across little stream, yeah? And I, I remember, I used to love doing this. Now they're all grown up, and now they just stride across. But when they were little, I would always go first, okay? I would step, and then, oh, we can do this. And then they would follow behind. And then they would start, and then I would sort of coach them, and I would stand on one, and I would say, "You can, you can make that. That one's quite slippy, so you need to make sure that, oh, careful, you don't. Oh, you put your foot in the water. That's okay. It's fine. Your socks will dry, and then you, and, and then back onto the next one, and, and and a little incremental jump or step towards where we're heading. And I, I just think this is a help, it's certainly helpful for me and Sarah in terms of, God, where are you leading us in the steps of generosity? And many of us here have, uh, have made huge steps and big leaps. And remember the widow's might, it's not about the distance. It's not about the distance you've leaped, it's about the attitude of heart as you leap, okay? Um, and I, I just wonder whether that's a helpful um, image to have in our minds as we think a little bit about giving, as we think a little bit about giving. So Barnabas made a big leap 
as he stepped um, into in, and gave his field. Um, but he stepped into the new adventure of giving as he made those incremental steps. And Julie said this morning, she said some profound things, but one of them was, he hasn't finished with us yet. He hasn't finished with us yet. And, you know, some of us, we may have made some steps um, on our stepping stones, and we may be, like, a little bit stuck and going, well, I've, I've been giving X amount, and that's good, and that is a, a great blessing, and that is a wonderful thing. But I wonder whether there's an, a next step, and it might be a really small step in line with inflation. <laughs> Sorry, did I say that out loud? Yes, I did. Um, <laughs> Chris is going, yeah, good point. <laughs> um, or it might feel like a really big step, but it is an incremental step. And we are moving. We're moving towards the heart of Christ. We're moving towards the heart of Christ in, in taking those steps. So I wonder what the step is for you this evening. What's the, the step? You know, each gift day is a chance to do another step. And, uh, but we remember, we remember, it's, uh, it's not the distance, it's the heart attitude that's important. I'm going to come into land here. I think I've spoken quite enough, and 7% and all that. So let's, uh, let's respond in some way. How are we going to respond to this? I think that that image is really important. And I wonder whether we might all just ask God in the quietness of this moment as to the step that we're on. And Julie said this morning, it's really important to look back and see where we've come from. To see the steps, the provision that God has made in our lives. But he's also calling us to new steps. He's calling us as St. Michael's to a new thing, to new steps of faith. And he's calling each of us as individuals to new steps of faith. Little jumps, incrementally. So I wonder whether we're all, and I, I just reiterate this, and Vicky mentioned this very early on, if you're new here, you know, we're not expecting you to give to the life of St. Michael's. But I, I would say if you are you know, serious about your discipleship with Jesus, Giving is a crucial part of that. I wonder what the next step is for you, where you are, where you might be. Let's invite the band up um, as we think um, about these things. We're going to have a little moment here. Um, they're going to play a little bit of music, and we're actually going to, in our response time, we're going to spend some time just uh, asking God. You know, the, the early church were empowered by the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that empowers us today, the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, the same Spirit that animated Christ and enabled him to do extraordinary things dwells in us. And he gives us the gift of faith in this.